Welcome to the track on improving your teams. I'm so happy that you're here today. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who is Linda Rising. I've known Linda all my life. <laughs> she's a little unusual, and of course, she's incredibly old. But every now and then, she says something interesting. So we will hope that this is one of those occasions. Please welcome Linda Rising. <laughs> Thank you so much. We're going to talk about retrospectives and my experiments with continuous retrospectives. So let's see if this is really going to work for me. Yeah, there we go. So I have started only focusing on things I really care about. And as the introducer said, and is pretty obvious, I'm incredibly old. And I know I won't be able to do this much longer. It takes a tremendous amount of energy to haul my old aging body across the water and stand up in front of all you enthusiastic young people and try to make sense. So one of the things I'm doing is giving away my slides. So I know that you're going to have access to the slides, yes, but I will email you the PowerPoint. Because if the idea of continuous retrospectives is something that's interesting to you, and maybe you'd like to share this with your team, but they weren't either in this session or didn't come to the conference, then one thing you can do is take the slides, adapt them, because they're yours now, and give this presentation in your workplace with the idea of trying some experiments with continuous retrospectives. So on the first slide is my email address, linda at lindarising.org. And in fact, it's not only true for this presentation, but for anything. If you see me on YouTube or have heard one of the other presentations that I give, I'll send you the PowerPoint for that as well. And then you can talk about bonobos or mindsets or any one of the other topics that interest me. If you've noticed in the bookstore, I hope, they've got a big stack of my new book, which is More Fearless Change. This is a book that came out last year, and it's after a 10-year writing adventure with my co-author, Mary Lynn Manns. We work in 10-year cycles, and it took us 10 years to write Fearless Change, another 10 to write More Fearless Change. There are some new patterns in there, and then Deb Proust, who created the Fearless Journey Game, has come out with cards for all of the patterns in the new book. So the bookstore doesn't have those, but you can buy them online. So a uh, shameless plug for more Fearless Change. I'm going to take you through a little bit of my own personal history with retrospectives, which started in 1998. I was working for a medium-sized telecom company, and we knew that we had to experiment with some new projects, and so we started on an adventure. We had a little project that ran for three years. When it started, it had six pretty good people on it, and over that three years grew to 120. Now, I learned about something called the sunk cost effect by watching that project. Because every six months, there would be a meeting of staff, and we would look at the progress for that particular project, and we would say, well, they're not doing so well. Maybe we should think about canceling this project. And someone at the table would say, oh, well, no, we, we, we can't cancel this project. We've already spent a million dollars. Six months later, well, maybe we should think about canceling this project. Well, no, we can't. We, we've already spent $2 million. How many of you have ever seen that? The sunk cost effect. That once you have any sizable investment in an adventure, you're reluctant to cut your losses and say, 
maybe we should think about doing something else instead. So by the time they finally decided to cancel that project after it had run for three years and had cost the company $10 million, and notice this is 1998, so a million dollars was worth a lot of money. Produced nothing. So after the cancellation, my boss came to me and he said, Linda, I know you're interested in patterns. Couldn't you look at what happened here? And, and, and couldn't you see, are, are there patterns for what went on? Couldn't we learn a, from our experience? Couldn't we somehow document that experience as patterns so we wouldn't do that again? I said, well, I, I don't know of any patterns for this kind of adventure, but I, I will look around, and I have a good friend who's working on something interesting, I will contact him, and I'll bet he would help me. His name was Norm Kurth. Anybody ever heard of Norm Kurth? Okay. Norm Kurth was working on an interesting book. He was calling it Project Retrospectives. It wasn't finished yet in 1998, but he was a patterns guy, and I knew that he was a fan of learning and documenting things in patterns. So I called up Norm and I said, Norm, you got to help me out. I, I don't know what I'm doing here. Would you guide me through some of these? I know you're doing exercises. I know you're working with teams to learn from experience. Well, how do you do that exactly? And when I told my boss that I had found somebody who would guide me through a process that might help us learn, and I said, he's calling it a retrospective, a project retrospective. Um, and that's what my boss said. Is that a postmortem? Because we did that. We did postmortems. Have you heard that word before? Do you like it? I don't, I personally don't like it. I, I know we're, we're largely Danish speaking here, but this is Latin. Do you know what post-mortem means? Yeah, what, what does it mean? Translate, in, in, in English, not in Danish, but what, what, what's it mean? Yes, post, after, mortem, death after death. And the word comes from a practice in medicine where we look at someone who has died and we want to determine what it was that caused the death. And of course, no matter what we learn, it's really not going to help the guy who's lying on the slab. It's too late. It's too late. And that was one of the problems with post-mortems, is that it really didn't add any benefit for the person who was receiving that exercise. And that transferred then into software teams. The teams that had already died, well, it was too late. And most of the time, that post-mortem, well, it was filed away somewhere, either on real paper or digitally, and no one ever looked at it again. So when my boss said, are, are you talking about a post-mortem? I said, no, I don't think so. I think, I think this is different. This is about real learning. It's about taking the time to really learn something, not just to say, what went wrong and who's to blame and whose decision led us in this bad direction, what caused the death. No, this is about standing back and a retrospective is about thinking. Retrospect. Stop and think and learn from the experience without worrying about whose fault it was. 
no laying of blame at the feet of a high-level decision maker or of a team of people or... No, no, this was, this was different. Norm said it's a chance for us to get together and learn how to improve. It's about learning, not fault-finding. And he introduced something that often gets lost because I'll bet everybody in the room has done a retrospective, haven't you? Yeah, you're calling it that. And how many of you do it regularly? Whatever that means, regularly, sure. And how many of you know what the prime directive is? Not so many. Because it is about learning, and the only way that can happen is that if we realize what Norm did. Because I didn't at first. I read this, and I, I said, Norm, what are you talking about? The prime directive. I have to go in to this meeting, and I have to say to myself, I believe I believe that everybody that was working on this project was doing the best job he or she could, given, of course, what they knew at the time, what they faced, their skills and abilities. Of course, all of those things have changed since. We learned a lot in doing this project, but at the time, they were all doing their best. Now, so many people struggle with that. And in fact, if you Google on Prime Directive, Linda Rising, there are all sorts of discussions that I have led, one for InfoQ, where people weighed in on how impossible, how impossible this is. And the argument goes something like, well, I know I don't even do the best I can. So how can I say that other people on the team were doing the best they could. They were being very, very rational. And what Norm realized is if a team subscribes to this belief, and if they begin each retrospective by saying, yes, for the duration of the retrospective, I will try to believe that everyone on the team was doing the best job, and so forth, that if a team does that, it's like a little ritual and that over time, it changes the way your brain thinks about yourself and about your team members and about how they work. And you come to be a team that begins to really and truly believe that. That's what we do in religion. We say that affirmation of faith. Sometimes we think, I'm not sure I really believe this, but I always say it anyway, and it's in the saying of it. We've heard some great talks today about science, but most of the time our talks are about religion. They're about belief. We don't have any proof that Agile is any better than anything else, but we believe in it. I'm a believer. Aren't you? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Well, then, of course, we always have to talk about the Agile Manifesto. The part that is important for us is this little principle that says, at regular intervals... So now, instead of thinking about a project retrospective, that's something that you do at the end of the project. Projects sometimes run for years. So that means at the end of a two-year project, you're just going to do one project retrospective, and then you might not do another one for another two years or three years. But now the manifesto said, no, you need to get together more often than that. These intervals are shorter. Not sure, it's not specified exactly, but it's shorter. And notice the wording here. It says, the team reflects on how to become more effective and then tunes. How many of you are musicians or know anything about tuning an instrument? Okay, good. So this will be a, a, an appropriate metaphor. When you tune an instrument, you have to do it every time you play it. 
You can't just say, well, I'm going to let it sit in the corner, and then every two years I'll tune it up. No, every violin player, every guitar player, every and I was a harpsichord player, every harpsichord player has to tune that instrument every time they play it. That's a lot. In fact, I finally gave up harpsichord. I couldn't stand it. 40 keys, and you got it. By that time, I didn't have any time to practice. It was all over with. Better to get an electronic keyboard, and then you can just go harpsichord. <laughs> Technology is wonderful sometimes when it works. So tuning, small adjustment. In fact, if your guitar or your harpsichord or your violin is drastically out of tune, you know that you can't actually get it up to pitch because if you adjust too much, you're going to put a lot of stress on the instrument, a stress on the strings. You can't do it. So you have to do it often, and those adjustments have to be small. So now we're talking about something very different retrospectives as we do them in agile development are not about project and a project retrospectives they're about getting together every two weeks or every three weeks and we're going to do little things some little tiny things to tune and adjust and there have been lots of books now about agile retrospectives my favorite is the first book that was written by my friends Esther Derby and Diana Larson I recommend it. I don't know whether it's in the bookstore or not, but you should have a look at it. And they started talking about continually. And by that, they meant every two weeks or every three weeks with the idea that, yeah, we were going to do some of the things you did in a project retrospective, but not everything was appropriate since we were going to do them more often. And the changes, well, they had to be smaller. About this time, I began to be interested in cognitive neuroscience. After all, if we don't do any science, it behooves us to at least look at those areas that are so that we could transfer some of that learning to what we do and we could take advantage of the fact that there is real science going on in other parts of the world that might help us do a better job. So in particular, this little area of your brain that sits over your right ear, it's called the right temporal parietal junction, or RTPJ. And it's an area that doesn't develop until you're almost five or six. And it has to do with your ability to innovate, your creativity. And it's also devoted to one other special capability that you have that many mammals do not, which is you can think about what others are thinking. It's also called theory of mind. And that fits perfectly with what goes in a retrospective, where we look at what everyone else is thinking, what do you think about what happened on this project, either over the last two weeks or the last two years? We are thinking about what others are thinking. So we're exercising the part of our brain that is involved in insight and creativity. And if we do that often, instead of staring at our phones we'll be more innovative and more creative. So there's a big plus for retrospectives. If you want to know more about that, I recommend this TED Talk by Rebecca Sachs. She's a neuroscientist who studies that little tiny piece of your brain. In More Fearless Change, we built on that and some other cognitive neuroscience in the pattern that's called Concrete Action Plan. Because in a retrospective, we often come up with an action plan. What are we going to do as a result of everything that we've learned? And what the research shows is that just thinking about good things or what we are going to do in a positive light is not effective. The neuroscience says you have to balance the consideration of any action you're going to take by looking at the negative sides. And in fact, if you do that in a sort of 
well, on the one hand and on the other hand approach, which reminds me of patterns, that is the best way forward. So examine every one of your concrete action plans by saying, well, here would be the benefit, but on the other hand, and address all of those negative consequences and side effects because they are going to be there, and that will make your plan stronger and more realistic. So there's a lot of evidence from cognitive neuroscience that says the way we run our businesses, the way we run our conferences, is not good. So here we are in a, in a room with no natural light when we know the sun is shining. Here we are in a room where you're sitting and what have you been doing for the last two days? You have been sitting, have you not? I walk and I stand and I move around and I look around to see if there are others. So there, I know there are a few of you who are standing and walking, but most of you are sitting. And what do you do all day? You sit. And what do you do in your retrospectives? Come on. You're sitting. You're sitting. So what the research shows is that is absolutely the worst position for anything. Well, let's see. We could think of maybe some good things that would come out of that. But we sit too much. So the research shows we need to move. We need to spend more time walking around. So we need to move. We also need to take a break. This conference has done a pretty good job of that. Would you agree? You have nice breaks in between each of the sessions. You don't feel like you're running, that you have a minute or two minutes to get to the next session. Would you agree? The breaks are good, so that's, that's not too bad. How many of you uh, got a lot of sleep last night? Oh, some of you did. Well, actually, let's take a poll. On average, not last, I was thinking of last night was the party, but on average, on average, how many of you get 10 hours of sleep a night? Hire this guy. <laughs> That's what Einstein got. Nine hours on average. Is that a, are you sure? Don't you know? She's, she's not, she's hesitant. She's eight. Okay, well, so eight. Eight, all right, very good. Seven? Okay. Seven is the global average, and it is decreasing. So most of us have the idea that, well, if we didn't have to sleep, we'd have so much more time. And what the research shows is that if you don't sleep, well, actually, if you don't sleep at all, you will die. So that solves that problem. But if you don't sleep enough, you don't learn. That's when learning consolidation happens. So not sleeping enough means that you're not at your best for a retrospective or anything else. That's why a lot of companies now are having nap rooms. How many, anybody in the room? Nap. All right. Very good. Nap rooms. Excellent. Okay. We've had plenty to eat. Wouldn't you agree? And the food has been wonderful. Okay, that's, that's a good thing. And, well, yesterday was rainy. Today was absolutely beautiful. How many of you got outside? Stepped outside. Okay. And not just the smokers. <laughs> okay. Others, to get outside every day is important. It's important for your health because we don't have any natural light coming in here. And that's for a reason, of course, and you could rationalize that away. But it's not good for your health, and it's certainly not good for your ability to innovate or for anything that might come out of a retrospective. And there ha I haven't noticed any plants or animals or babies. Have you? No. So we're much better. I mean, uh, when uh, we do have a speaker this afternoon who likes cats. So I think we're going to have some cats, but not real ones, though. No. Well, we should have some real cats. 
or real dogs or, or birds. Or, so we, we do much better. Uh, because the problem is this is what we do all day. We sit. Sometimes we don't take a break and go outside. So no natural light. I once worked on a big project to produce an airplane. I was really exciting. It was the triple seven. But no matter what time I went in in the morning, usually about 6 a.m., my boss looked at his watch. He didn't say anything. He just looked at his watch. And the message was, you're just coming in now? 6 a.m.? The implication was, well, he's already been here probably for hours and hours. I'm just walking in at 6 a.m. And when I left, usually at midnight, he looked at his watch. You're leaving now? You've only been here since 6 a.m. You're leaving now at midnight? So when I went to work in the morning, there was no sun. And when I left, no sun. Do you think that's a good thing? Do you think that makes me more productive? So now there's research, there's real scientific research that says no. And after a while, you're going to be sick, which I was. I mean, it was exciting working on an airplane. but So no, no natural light. We have a certain amount of time, usually, for a retrospective. And it's usually not very long. So we have to come up with innovative ideas. Come on, think fast. Let's get this done. we got to get out of here. we got deadlines to meet. Everything has to be done in a very short time frame. We don't work well that way either. And of course, we can't remember, even over a short iteration, two weeks, can't remember what happened. Because we were thinking about other things, and now suddenly we have to become introspective, we have to reflect and think about what we were doing. And our focus is always on, we got to do something. We got to have some action items and not so much on the learning. So I led a workshop where we examined all of the benefits that cognitive neuroscience is telling us that would help us work better, that would help us think better, that would help us be more innovative. And everyone came up with lots of suggestions for how we could make retrospectives better, how we could bring in taking a break or having naps or having more exposure to nature, or let's bring in some more color, or let's have some snacks, let's have something to eat or drink, and came up with lots of great ideas. And so I began to sort of, just like we've got sticky notes posted on a flip chart, I started adding those onto retrospectives, taking what we had been doing and, and sticking these new ideas onto retrospectives with the idea of making them better. And then in 2013, I was giving a talk at FlowCon, and the person who invited me there was Jazz Humble, and we started talking about continuous stuff. Everything is continuous. Continuous delivery, continuous integration, continuous testing. And for some reason, my brain said, well, wouldn't we want to have continuous retrospectives? I mean, I mean, if everything else is continuous, why couldn't we do that? And, and if we did, well, what would it look like? I mean, we can't constantly say, oh, i got to think about something. To do. I'm trying to learn what I'm do from what I'm doing as I'm doing it. I'm, I mean, how, how would we make all that work? And somehow in listening to a talk he was giving at that conference, I thought, I have got this backwards. I'm trying to take what we have been doing and I'm trying to force it into a new model by saying, well, let's just take this old idea and let's just add some babies and some food and some naps, and it'll be better. When instead, I should be saying, what would be the best way to reflect constantly 
and let that grow into what continuous retrospectives are all about. And I thought, I'm not sure. But I sure know that other people might have ideas about it. And so let's begin to experiment. So the first team I worked with said, OK, here's what we're going to do. We're going to run our regular timeline. How many of you do a timeline in your retrospectives now? OK, usually it's done after. So either at a project retrospective is after the project. At an iteration retrospective, it's after the iteration, where you build a timeline. And the timeline is a piece of either a whiteboard or a series of flip charts. And on it are recorded what happened at particular moments throughout that project or iteration. And I like to do it with colors, so you wind up with something like that. It's a series of sticky notes index cards, whatever you want to use. And on it is a description of what happened. And then we line them up in a timeline. So what we've got is kind of the story of what went on, either in the project or in the iteration. So for my first experiment, the team said, OK, that, we're going to use that exercise. Only we're going to build the timeline in real time. So we're not going to wait until the end of the iteration. At the beginning of the iteration, we're going to start building the timeline in real time. And as things happen, we're going to go to the timeline. We're going to put our sticky note or that index card, and it's going to say, this is what is happening now. So I don't have to worry about remembering it, because I capture that in the moment, hence real time. And then we're going to add something else to the timeline. And since that original experiment, lots of other teams have done this many different ways. This first team said, we're going to draw a line under the ordinary timeline. And down here, we're going to put ideas for experiments in real time. So this event just happened. I'm going to put it on the timeline. And when I post that, I suddenly realize I've got an idea for an experiment that we could even start doing now. And I'm going to write another little sticky note or index card, and it's going to be right under that. And I'm going to say, because of that, I thought of this idea, and I'm going to start my small experiment now. I'm not going to wait until the end of the iteration. I'm not going to wait to post to the timeline. I'm not going to wait for any actions. I'm going to do it now. These are all small things. So that means that instead of waiting even a short time, even two weeks, waiting to say, all right, now let's reflect on what happened. Now let's think about concrete action items, even if we try to do that in a neurologically satisfying way. Instead of waiting, we're going to do it as we think about it. And so that means we're thinking about it all the time. Now that means we're thinking about it all the time unconsciously as well as consciously. So I don't know if you've ever seen this diagram before, but it's a picture of your brain. It's really a metaphor. It's really a fake picture of an iceberg. And the story used to be something like, well, do you, you see the top of the iceberg there? That's kind of like your conscious mind. And that big, giant piece, that's the unconscious. The unconscious mind is so overwhelming that, and is so underused. Well, now the metaphor has shifted a little bit. I don't know if you can see it, but at the very top of that peak, there's a little snowball. That's your conscious. And the rest, all of the rest, is your unconscious mind. So your conscious mind is really, you didn't think you were going to get into this really weird stuff when you came in here, did you? 
and now you're wondering, gee, I could have been out in the sunshine. I could have enjoyed it. That little tiny snowball's hardly there. That's your conscious mind. And in fact, there are some neuroscientists that wonder why we have it. It's so ineffective. It, it mostly just gets in our way. How many of you have read the reference here? Dan, <coughs> Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. Wow, okay, Did, is that the same guy who slept 10 hours? I was going to say, boy, there's this, let's, let's really hire that. So in, in Thinking Fast and Slow, Kahneman gives those areas names. He said, I'm going to call your unconscious System 1. And what we know about System 1 is that it's very fast. It never sleeps. It works 24-7. It's very intuitive. And it never forgets anything. It knows every book you've ever read, every lecture you've ever heard. It has an enormous amount of information. And most of the time, we ignore it because we are so focused on, we are so wedded to that conscious, that little snowball, what Kahneman calls system two, the rational mind that is very slow, cannot multitask, and forgets everything. So when I say that people are thinking about ideas for experiments that are considering what happened and what can be learned from that, most of that should be offloaded to the unconscious. And as we go to the timeline and we post something, then the unconscious will say, Ah, I've got an idea for you. Why don't you try a small experiment and out will come the idea for that little tiny experiment. You won't have to consciously agitate that very small snowball of a brain that you think is the major part of what thinking is all about. Hand it over to the big workhouse that can work on that 24-7. Someone asked in an earlier presentation about a bias. It's probably our worst. We have a lot of biases, and they all reside in System 1. That's why we're so quick. We've got a whole raft of biases that help us with our decisions. The confirmation bias is the worst. The confirmation bias says essentially that you, since you were born, have been working on a little set of filters that you carry around with you all the time. And that set of filters makes sure that you don't hear, that you don't see, that you don't become aware of anything that doesn't fit with what you have already learned. Now, we're always working on those filters. Yours are unique to you. Mine is unique to me. But one thing we know for sure is that if we don't want to believe that, if we don't want to hear it, we will not. Now, I don't know if you're aware that in the U.S. currently we're in the middle of a big political upheaval. Anybody been noticing? Yeah, we have. So I can really tell. I can see the confirmation bias at work in myself. No matter how hard I try. I cannot watch any kind of debate. I cannot listen to any kind of speech. I cannot be open to anything that one of those candidates is saying. Do you know what I mean? I just can't hear it. I can't be open to the possibility that there might be a, the smallest shred of intelligence residing in that person's head. I just can't do it. So I know I have already made up my mind about that particular individual, and I can't get past that. I can feel that in myself. So we all have that, and it gets in our way. So one of the offerings for some kind of continuous retrospective is that when you put something up immediately, then lots of other people will see it. In fact, they may be at the timeline. They may be posting their own thoughts and ideas and events so that you're continually comparing notes 
and looking at others' points of view. And in fact, that is the only way around the confirmation bias is to force yourself to be around people who don't agree with you. I don't know how many of you signed up for the decision class that's going to be on Thursday, but we will talk about this bias there. That is your worst enemy when it comes to making decisions because you can't get past it. You can only do it if someone will help you. And they will, can only help you by saying, well, I'm not sure I see it that way. Here's how I see it. And that is your only hope for getting past all those filters and things we have built up over our lifetimes. Charles Darwin knew that he had this. And he said, as soon as I run across something that doesn't agree with my previous research, I have to write it down immediately. Because if I don't, I know I will begin to work around it. I will begin to so try to seek out evidence that will show that it's not true. And so the real-time timeline enables you to do the same thing. Darwin had his own real-time timeline. As he thought of it, he wrote it down. As the team is thinking about it, they will write it down. That allows other people to see it, other people to exchange ideas about it. So the benefits for the teams now, there have been uh, six or eight that have tried this, is that you're thinking about it 24-7. And then you go away. You take a break. Maybe you go away and don't come back until the next day, so that means you've had a chance to sleep on it even better. While you're doing it, you're walking. In fact, the teams I know now kind of go out of their way to walk past the timeline frequently. Just walk past, see what new information is up there, what new ideas for experiments. It's the gathering place. They have their stand-ups there. They have little short meetings there. And it's open to the rest of the organization. Uh, there's also an interesting psychological effect called the Zagarnik effect that says once you've written something down, you can sort of say, I've taken care of that, and I can move on to think about more things. So positive benefit always in documenting anything. We had a great talk on documentation. This is a long quote, which I will, since you're going to ask me for the slides anyway, you can read it. We should be looking to the military the military has been agile long before software even knew how to spell it. And this is a quote from the Marines who say, we never think about big change anymore. We're always looking for ways to come up with new ideas to make small change. That's the best way for anything that's sustainable. And then the goal would be, could you include your values, what you think is important, what we know is that when you start talking about values, teams somehow can collaborate more effectively. We may not agree on everything, but our values will draw us together because at the core, we do care about a set of small things, and that's what will drive us forward. Let me close with this experiment that was done with a Wipro team. They were going through some training and they were going to have a test on their training. So they had a little experiment. With one group, they said, at the end of every day, we want you to take 15 minutes and just write down your reflections on what happened that day. And the other group was just instructed to keep on working for that 15 minutes. Well, 15 minutes, that's nothing, right? They didn't give them any more information during those 15 minutes. Just one team took a little time every day to think what happened today, what they thought about what happened that day. And what they noticed when they gave them their final exams is that the group that took time to just write a little bit every day had better test scores, increased by 22.8% over the control group that just continued working for another 15 minutes. So this is, is evidence, and there's a whole host of evidence for reflection. And there's a whole host of evidence for reflection 
in an ongoing fashion that now as we move to continuous delivery, testing, integration, that we should move to continuous reflection so we can have continuous learning. And of course, we need them all. You need to do project retrospective. That's where the strategic lessons come out. And those small iteration retrospectives, well, yeah, of course. Those are tactical decisions. And then the real-time, continuous reflection, yes, that's where you're going to get great ideas for experiments. So you need them all. And I'm hoping that you will go try something and that you will let me know what you did and how successful it was. And if you want to send me some pictures, I haven't found anybody who was willing to share exactly what their real-time timeline looked like yet, but maybe you will do that for me. And then you can show me what it looks like for you, and then I can share it with others. So will you try it? Will you try a little experiment? All right. Here are some patterns from Fearless Change if you need those. And remember, you'll have the PowerPoint. You can talk to your teams about it. So I hope it wasn't too weird, you know, with the iceberg stuff and all that unconscious. You're okay with that? Yeah, okay, good. So thanks for being here. I appreciate it. I know you stayed in here with no natural light. And, but now we're going to we have a little break, and you can have some food Go outside. Go outside now, please. Thank you.